I hope everybody had a good break. And we're now going to proceed. Defense. Yes. The tape of Officer Roger in the early morning hours after this incident happened. Yes. Uh, we're going to play it through its, in its entirety. Um, Are you admitting it as evidence right now as Exhibit yes. 5? Yes, 5. And state it, is that correct? Okay. Exhibit 5 is the walkthrough, comes into evidence by stipulation. <clears throat> No, no earphones needed. Okay. Would you mind though if I come over there? No, not at all. I'm a detective with the Bombs County Sheriff's Office of Bombs Crimes Division. Today's date is October 18, 2015. Approximate time is 0750 hours. We are currently in the area of 4300 PGA Boulevard on the I-95 South Bend off ramp on 2 PGA Boulevard. I'm presently investigating an officer-involved shooting. The incident occurred at approximately 03. At 0315 hours on today's day, 10 18 2015. The events under investigation took place in and around our current location. These circumstances are being documented on the PBSO case number 15 133920. It's also being investigated under Farmers Gardens case number 15 005522. Present with me are the following officials. Witness officer is, can you state full name and your ID with Starting. Officer Glenn Roger, IAJ, ID number 438. Can you also spell your first name? It's Willman, L U M A N. Alrighty. And representing the state attorney's office is Tom Wills. And you don't have an ID number, I don't know. Legal counsel is Lawrence Fagan, TDA counsel on behalf of Officer Roger. And also present for Palm Beach Gardens Internal Affairs is Tom Todd Grossman. Awesome. And other investigators are going to be Sergeant Karpinski, K-A-R-P-I-N-S-K-I, I mean 6682. And also Detective Feifel, P-F-E-I-F-L-E, and ID number 9585. Crime scene videographer is Keith Thomas. I have no idea what your ID number is, Keith, but you're back there. Okay, at my request, Officer Roger has agreed to provide a sworn videotape recording description of his recollections and actions regarding this criminal investigation. Officer Roger, have you had the opportunity to speak privately with legal counsel, Mr. Fagan? Yes, I have. Okay. Officer Roger, are you aware that a representative from the Internal Affairs Division will be monitoring this reenactment and this is not a, considered a guarantee, compelled statement? Yes. Okay. Officer Roger, are you aware this is a voluntary procedure and that you may decline to continue at any time? Yes, sir. Okay. Do you feel as though you are emotionally prepared to provide an accurate reenactment? I believe so. Okay. Do you have any questions about the reenactment procedure before we begin? No. Okay. Everything good? Yes, sir. Okay. Oh, wait one second. Okay. Having all this 
this in mind, do you wish to proceed with the reenactment? Yes, I do. Okay. Do you swear or affirm that the evidence you're about to provide will be the truth, the entire truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Okay. What I want you to do is I want you to go into as great as detail as you can why you were here, how you came about this. But first, I just have a few preliminary questions. Sure. Do you currently work for the Palm Beach Gardens Police Department? Yes, sir. How long have you worked for them? Uh, since April of 2015. April of 2015? Yes, Any previous law enforcement before Yes, sir. I was a uh, sergeant with the Atlanta Police Department, and I started in Atlanta in 2007, and I came to uh, swung more up. Once I talked out there, I wanted to go. Okay. What are your current duty assignments here with Palm Beach Gardens? Uh, currently assigned to road patrol on midnight shift, late night, uh, 730, p uh, 1930 to 4.30. Okay. Was that your shift? Yeah, like, I'll be okay, sorry. Was that your shift that you were working last night? Yeah, last night was my Friday. We were four days on, four days off. Okay, last night was my last day on. Okay. Um, what do you normally wear in your duties? On a normal days, uh, we would have a full uniform with a badge and the name tag. For the last, uh, since September 30th or so, we've had a lot of legal burglaries in our area and everything, and we were getting hit with them a lot. So starting the last week we started with this, we were setting up decoy cars, and at midnight, I'm a uh, Alpha 1 cover shift, so basically at beat one which is far out west, and there's not really that much happens. So they also used me as a cover unit to go to 94 here, go pick this call up and everything. So since I don't, there might be there's only PGA and National and Marisol, the two communities. So at midnight, I would go set up the decoy cars and stuff like that. I would dress down in street clothes and I've been doing this for the last four nights. And I would either take this van or we have a Gold Crown Victoria unmarked and I would take that and basically drive around uh, residential neighborhoods and everything blacked out and the windows down and see if I can see if we see any uh, murders occurring. Okay, did you have anything on you this evening after you dress down? Um, showing that you're a police officer, yeah. you have a badge or anything? Uh, inside, first of all, uh, I always have my wallet badge with me, a okay. uh, police ID, which is for policy. Uh, and on top of that, inside my van, I had my tactical vest with had police in the front, police on the back, my name, Aggie Stitch, Tom, the vest, also Roger, and I had my duty holster with me inside the van. And the whole thing was, uh, tonight specifically while I was in the van was, at the start of our rotation at the, in our lineup, we were told that we might be plugged back right down the road where PJ and RC is called Lux, and across the road is downtown at the garden, the Dirty Martini. Lux, Lux how do you guys? They were having a hip hop concert tonight, and there was supposed to be a huge crowd gathering tonight. So we decided to, if you're in the back of the van, you'll see eight riot shields this back here, the loudspeaker, crime scene tape, and uh, six, uh, you know. And our thing was this hey, if anything happens, if, you know, if, it, uh, if there's a big incident that lost, if there's a big fight, we scared the crowd. We're going to forget about the 21 and report with the man immediately to lock. So the officers have quick access to it. And uh, so, and the number two thing that was also uh, discussed was this. Why am I in street clothes? Why am I in this? I do not do any takedowns. I do not do anything. But just in case of emergency, something happens, you know, that's why I have the vest and everything. I just find on me. I'm supposed to call the low unit to come out to handle any situations. Okay. Um, just to go back kind of quick, for other people that aren't police officers, yes, I'm sorry. If you would, just in the future, stop using the signal codes and stuff, because somebody may not understand it. Yeah. You use 94, which we know is backed up in 21, which is burglary. Yeah. So if you can just use plain talk, okay, but for the future, just in case, because some of the non police officers may not understand what you're talking about at that point. Um, is that part of that? You want to go into the reaction? You, you said, um, you're supposed to go back up during situations. What situations are you like, going back Like, for example, if I'm in one of the residential neighbors and I see a burglary occurring or something like that, or a suspicious vehicle or a suspicious person, to call the market and to give my position where I'm at and tell them, hey, this is where this person is moved. And then once the market comes out there, makes the initial stop, comes in contact, you know, throw my back on if I need to and everything like that, and then go ahead and make contact with them. Mm -hmm. and is there a person in charge of the tactical operation, if you will? Uh, it, was a, it wasn't really a tactical operation. It was just decided just amongst our uh, early ship and late ship. So it's uh, Sergeant Anderson, Sergeant Sprague, and Sergeant Josh Cable over here tonight are all aware of this. And they were monitoring. And one of the things was I actually built my laptop with our GPS unit that we were. So one of the things was this, hey, so you guys know exactly where I'm sitting, watching what area and everything. And every time I was doing this, I would, I would go to my laptop, log in, and hey, I'm over here, and I would write in my notes that, hey, if one's undercover van or the full town Victoria, this is where I'm at doing this. Okay. 
So when this operation began, yeah. did your whole ship sit down and uh, sergeants go over what the plan was, what you're to do? Exactly. We, we, we were going to stop that meeting, absolutely. We were going to go over the meeting. Also, you said you get your GPS in your laptop. Yeah. Does everybody have access to where you are through GPS on their laptop? Every single officer, every single sergeant, and dispatcher, the human screen and dispatcher that has the GPS chart shows exactly where the unit is. So if something happens, if I'm in my car, I can't get the video, I can say, find my GPS location. And also, you can see that you're going to have to go through the GPS chart. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's on right now. My laptop's in there too. I actually have my, uh, one of, I, I took like two or three t-shirts just in case somebody walked past. So, you know, I threw one on top of the laptop, threw one on top of the police, but you can't do the police stuff and things like that. Okay. All right. Okay, now what I'd like you to do is go into what happened this evening. Start as far back as you have to. Try to go into as much detail as you can. If you need to stop, stop. If you need a break, call us and let us know. Okay, and then try to be as elaborate as you can with okay. what happened, how it happened, why it happened, and what, what not. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, well, tonight at, uh, I couldn't really start the, this oper operation, if you want to call it, until midnight, because I was actually a backup officer on the domestic call in Evergreen. And second next day, the domestic call as a backup officer, I uh, went to the station, changed out everything to it, and got at the van, had the van prepped and everything like that. And I sent uh, start answering the message, because one of the things was we had, uh, we were assuming that these people that were doing a lot of the burglaries are coming from uh, Duke area, from the Heights. And we've checked, uh, and we've seen a couple of these suspicious people that we've, you know, checked out before and everything like that, walking south on military, walking south on central. So I started my day with, I started on PGA, I went down military, all the way down to Hood Road, went into the Donald Ross Village, drove around there, and then came down central, down PGA, and then I came back here, went to the gas station, got myself a drink and some snacks, which are still inside the van, and I started to hit, uh, do the community. And I was, as I was doing this, I was sending messages to Sarah Anderson on the laptop, hey, I'm going to this community, this community, this is what I just said, this is what I just said, so he's aware of the whole, so it's the chance man, so he's aware of my uh, location at all times. Uh, and then the first community was uh, the Isle. I did the Isle, and I was about to go to Evergreen, which is on Hood and uh, uh, Military, on the, uh, on the Northeast corner. Uh, and I was just about to go there and everything. And I remember that one of the two units responded to a domestic disturbance at the Marriott. And the club is located on the first floor of the Marriott. They responded to like on the fifth floor or something like that with a domestic disturbance that was created. And so, uh, Sergeant Anderson went there too. And as Sergeant Anderson was there, I remember him calling on the radio, hey, we have a disturbance going on downstairs in the nightclub, have officers respond. So as we kind of the different officers, which I had the video, I'm like, officers, I'm on the way, I'm on the way. So in my mind, I'm like, okay, this might be that call that, you know, it, it just might break through. So let me take the van, get out of where I was at it, and start heading down in this direction to be close to it, just in case if you know, something broke out the right here, everything like that, that we just talked about. So I turned on military, from military to PGA, and I was going eastbound on PGA. And as I was coming there and everything, I saw this vehicle stop here, didn't see anybody inside, nothing. And I called out, uh, I believe, on the radio, and I said that I've got a, uh, I thought it was a disabled vehicle on the side of the road or an abandoned vehicle. So I saw this vehicle and everything, and I was like, okay, I've got this vehicle on the side of the road, and you know, I'm going to check out and make sure everything's okay. And, you know, when I drove past it, there was no, I could not see anything, any occupants inside the vehicle. Or if I'm going to drive past it, he's not. He's not. So I went down to the next light right there, I made a U-turn, came in here, and I was, as I was coming out, I was like, you know, it's like, all right, this is an abandoned vehicle, this is the on -ramp. I'm just gonna pull in front from like this and park in front, and put my flashes on, and give this back to the taxi, see if I can see the horn, maybe they walk to the gas station, or have a tow, do what we need to do. But you know, it's like, I'm, and this is where I, 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 I'm kind of kicking myself in the ass, like, you know, it's like, think about hindsight. It's like, our, you know, golden rule is like, you know, always act like a vehicle's always off, but never take that chance of like, you know, it's a vehicle not being on but If I knew the vehicle was off, I would never put myself in a fatal funnel situation like this, but I pulled in front of it. And you know, I don't think there was anybody in there. And as I got close to the vehicle, and 
uh, the door swung open and uh, the guy up and I immediately got out and he's like, I'm okay, I'm okay, man. And at which point I said, hey man, police, can I help you? The second I said police, he jumped back and I clearly remember him drawing and go, pointing a gun at me. I saw that silver muzzle and he had, I can swear on this, he had a laser max laser and the guy brought him the gun. And I saw that red light, that laser max flashing at me. And I immediately just shouted, drop the gun and... And when you got out of the van, I mean, way did you go? Right here. I came right here. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Now, when you got out of the van, which way did you go? In front. Just like how okay. So, yeah, I, oh, okay. I, I immediately jumped up my hand right here. And at that point, I didn't, I didn't have a, what I had on me, the only thing I had on me, because I was uh, insane, like my gun was still inside, my uni gun, my vest was inside, and the only thing I had was my backup gun, my uh, department crew backup gun, and, uh, and, and waistband holster inside with a shirt tucked in like this. Uh, and I immediately said, hey man, police, can I help you? And at which point, that's when he jumped back and I saw him draw the gun right at me. Right after I said the word police, and it was like, bump! And it was just, I, I kind of got like caught in my pants down at that point. And it just immediately is like crap by a positive. This is like your family flash and throw your kids flash and throw you. And he just like, fuck! And just immediately up and down. I'm like, drop the gun, drop the gun! And he, and he did, and he was right there. And I remember pulling the trailer, I think, two to three times. And he started running. And as he was running, I had my cell phone and I dialed. And I would sit around and put my cord in, and just like this, I had the gun, I would keep an eye on this guy. And I'd put my cord in, got in my room, and I called the dispatch right away. My radio was banned. And the whole time, I'm like giving command, I'm yelling, screaming, and I'm like, drop the gun, drop the gun, drop the gun! And as he's running, he gets about like right, just a little past where the car wheels are, and he, he does this number. And I see his whole body spin, and I saw like a flash, a silver flash, like a metallic flash, come at me, and in my head, I immediately fucking said, aim, aim, and I was like, aim, and I was like, and I just picked that front side right in the center mat, and I just pulled the trigger three times, and I saw him drop, and I saw something silver fall. And at which point I was on the floor with this, but I just found the kitchen radio, kitchen radio, and I just held what I had right there. I couldn't really see where he dropped, what happened, if he moved right there. And I'm like, I don't see him, I don't have a visual on him, I don't have a visual. And I started to walk backwards and everything, came back to the van, grabbed the radio, grabbed everything, called out on the radio. And that happened, and so I was fragged with the first one, and I can't remember, it was one of the tourists, the new tourists, who was one, and that started happening poetry. And I got over here, I was like, God, right here, right here! And they quickly turned it right here, and uh, it was Arlotta, and he wore Arlotta. And Arlotta had his rifle flung up his fragged, and I was like, I'm all fired right there. Yes, sir. I'm on, this is for you, I'm on, this is for you, I'm on, this is for you, I'm having trouble. I'm sorry, I'm just a kid. Oh, yeah. absolutely. Um, I do. I do. Yeah. Now, while you were going through this, at any time, did that individual fire you, do you know if the gun went off? I, don't know. I, I was screaming at the top of my lungs. I was screaming, dropping. And the only thing I could think of was like, like I'm saying drop the gun. I announced myself to the police. Why the fuck is this guy pointing the gun at me? Like, okay. I don't know if he fired the same round. I, mean, I don't remember. Okay. Um, at any point, did you have any contact with that individual? Any kind of personal contact with no, you no. when you were walking up? No, as, and again, like he jumped up and he said, Hey, I'm okay. And I said, And I came out and said, I said, My back was red. And I made sure I was speaking loud. I was like, Hey, man, please, can I help you? And immediately, he, and he does a step back and kind of move and just draws the gun. Basically, you're standing right here. You mind if I? Absolutely. Where was. Oh, okay. Sure. Okay. 
No, no, that's my game plan. My game plan as I was coming from PGA was this. I thought it was a disabled vehicle, so I was going to pull in front of the van, in front of that Jeep, and put my flashes on, walk out, and you know, see what's going on, and call out the cab and call the or call the tow truck if I needed to get the vehicle. I thought it was a broke down vehicle. There was nobody in it. And is there a reason why you stopped here instead of pulling up? Because the guy jumped. The guy jumped out. He jumped out. His exactly. While you were in the car, he jumped out? He jumped out line immediately. He jumped out, too. Okay. Um, you were dressed exactly like this? Exactly. Before, not much? Exactly. Then, exactly. Right? Exactly like this. And I had my holster, which was covered. When your mouth was covered? It was covered. Did you have your gun in your waistband? No. Did you no. put your pair of gun? There's no big I have, I have a big stomach, so it kind of overhangs. We were in a tin hat. Exactly, just like this. Okay. And you said you started firing. Was that around the Uh I believe I, 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 I'm trying to think, but I remember being coming out and said, oh, I, I, I can't hear you. Yeah, well, I'm sorry. I'm, uh, I'm thinking. I, 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 I know. I, I know when he had the gun pointed at me around the car, and I said I fired. I know that. I. Do you remember exactly where he was at when he he? And let me go back. You said that you got out, you jumped out, and you came around here. When did the gun come into play, and where did it come from? He he jumped out of me and he said, "I'm okay, man." Uh, he said, "I'm okay, I'm okay." And I said, "Hey, man, please, can I help? Can I help you?" And second, I said. Uh, I, I remember. Oh, yeah, no, I'm, I'm not sure. No, 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 no. I remember clearly seeing this. The gun was right here. I remember seeing it above the door level, and it was in this area right here, pointing at my, directly at me. And I remember seeing the silver gun. I could clearly see the hole in the muzzle, and I could see that laser max laser in the guide box flickering. Like flickering red, red, on and off, on and off. Okay. So he was in this area. Yeah, he was in this vicinity, somewhere in this vicinity. Do you want to? What do you? Do you recall where you were standing and looking up the pistol? Did you know approximately where? Somewhere in, in this vicinity, somewhere. I don't recall exactly. Why don't you get somewhere between where and where? Oh. Drop the gun, drop the gun, drop the gun. 
and uh, I was screaming at the top of my lungs. What was he doing at that point? He was running, and right when he got about, uh, I think it was, because this is where I started to walk. I, I remember I was around that area by that pole, and I decided to walk back to get my radio again. And just like, go get your radio, Raj, go get your radio. And I just be careful right here. Oh, I'm sorry. And I remember over here as well was, and he must have been. Uh, do you see this plant right here? In the big one? Yeah, the big one. Just with the ditches right there in front of his stomach, he was in that area, and that's when he did the uh, spin. When I was young, I was like, the drop spin, and I saw him go like this. And, and I remember saying to myself, Aim! I still remember, and I was like, Aim! And I put that front sight right in the center of that, and I squeezed. I, I think, I believe, two rounds. Okay. And I saw him drop at this point, and when he dropped everything, I started going up, and I couldn't see him. And I was like, I lost sight of him, I lost sight of him. And they're like, go get your radio, go get your radio. And I started to go, and I was like, just pat him back and everything. And the guys came, and I was like, look, I'm off side of him right there. I don't know where he went to. And I think uh, one of the officers was up north, he was like, I think I see something up there, this and that. So, and then Sergeant uh, Spratt or Sergeant Anderson, one of the sergeants, who was like, Raj, come show me exactly where the last point we saw him. So I started walking up the garden with us, and started walking up, we saw him right there. Okay. What happened after that? But once we saw him and everything, he says, he was laying face down and both his hands were tucked underneath him. So Sergeant Anderson came to my left, he brought a shield. He was shield I was shield covered behind him. And Sergeant Spragg came to the north side of us from the, almost at the tree and he had a rifle out. And we said, okay, we need to approach him to make sure that you know he's still not armed what's going on and everything. So we slowly approached him and everything like that. But before that, uh, when they came, I ran to my van, I immediately put on my vest, and I immediately put on my uh, side holster, my duty gun. So once uh, once we started to approach him and everything like that, he was still wasn't moving. Gave him, I, th I, think, I think we gave him a couple of verbal commands, didn't respond, and started to say, Raj, go ahead and hold your hands, go hands on with him. I holstered immediately and they said they, they've got covered. I grabbed one arm, pulled it out, grabbed the other arm, pulled it out, and we said, let's, and Sergeant Anderson was back at Let's make sure he's not laying on top of the gun, and we just pulled him back, flipped him back, saw there was no gun visible and everything, and Sergeant Spragg said, okay, call fire rescue, all right, it's clear, and I came back here, and there was a rescue truck here, and I was covered in his blood, and I was like, yeah, can you just get this off? And they took, like, hydrogen peroxide, and they started pouring it all over, and they started washing it. All over you? Yeah, on, on my hands and arms. Okay, and, uh, and then I, th I think that either sometimes around that time there, like that, I remember Sergeant Maul was there and I was like, Sarge, here's the gun that I used right here. And I gave him that gun with the whole string of the extra man and everything was like that. And I think he put it in his trunk. Okay. All right. Um, Yes, sir. Is the shirt you have on? It's exactly just like this. On inside out. Inside out. Because it, uh, it's, it's a shirt with an American flag on it. Okay. And the, the night before I had a green shirt like this with an American flag on the office or what, like that gives you where the top, you got a flag on it, you're like, ah, they're going to flip it inside out. So I flipped it. Um, talk about conditions. Right now, I can see you. There's no street lights on. When I was right there with him, I could see him crystal clear. But when he started to run away from me, all I could see was a silhouette. And I, I could see his face, I could see this, and I could see his like body movements and stuff like that. He was wearing a black shirt, but you could like he wasn't like he wasn't really that dark black skin. Like he was he was uh, like just maybe a couple of shades darker than me. So you could make out this is where his shirt stopped, this is where his arms stop. And I could see him turn. And I could have sworn I saw that, like that silver thing, like when he turned, I saw some silver in his hand turn, and that's when I went, Ey! and squeezed off a few rounds. And the whole time I'm on the phone with dispatch. He said he pointed, he pulled the gun out of the and it was right up, right up, yeah. And it ended up at the end of the year, yeah. And you said, you described it as what? I saw a silver muzzle. I could clearly see the bore side hole, and underneath it, where the guy brought both of the handguns and everything like that, he had a laser, max laser, which blinks. 
And I'm speaking this from experience because I'm a firearms instructor and I, I teach civilian, I teach at the police academy and everything. And I can clearly identify a firearm when I see one, specifically when it's pointed in my direction. And you indicated, you testified that you were, you were pretty quick on the draw. Yeah. You throw it out uh, quick. Are you pretty quick? I, I practice. Like there's no, I practice all the time. And he pointed his gun at you at, at there? At there. He pointed. He pointed like uh, when I said, "Hey man, police, can I help you?" And that's when he pointed and jumped back, pointed his gun at me, and I couldn't do it. Okay. Why did you shoot him there? I I I thought I should have shot him. I thought I pulled the trigger. Uh -huh. I I thought I shot him. I thought I shot at him. When you first pulled out your gun? Yeah. When I first pulled out the gun, I gave him like, "Drop the gun! Drop the gun!" And when he and when he didn't, I think I I I believe I shot him there. Okay. Okay. How many rounds? Think you fired in total? Five. Okay. Maybe six. Five. I mean, I mean, I'm a gun in the kind of like Glock 27, 40 out with many Glock, many Glock. Did you, did you, when he pointed the gun at you, when you pulled your gun and you thought you fired, could you, at any point, either there or down there, see if, uh, Muzzle flash, you're familiar with muzzle yes, flash? Yes, absolutely. I, yes, I, did you ever see that come out of the sky? I didn't, I didn't even see my own muzzle flash. I didn't even hear my own dunk of All I remember was just the motion of pulling that trigger. I didn't, I didn't even know if I, I, I couldn't even hear my own band. I think I was just so like dropped down, dropped down. I couldn't hear my own band. Okay. Okay. Did you see anything else happen after that? Uh, after that, 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 uh, after as police officers, we often patrol with a kind of a heightened sense of alertness. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Do you think that your level, what, how would you describe your level of alertness when you first saw this car and then before he pulled the fire about? Yes, I mean, first of all, I didn't even know he was inside the car. Uh -huh. and, and that that's exactly what I'm talking about. I'm kicking myself in the ass in hindsight 2020. And I preach this at the academy. Always, when we see a abandoned vehicle, when we see something like that, always treat it like there's somebody inside that you never know. And I go and do the cynical thing, like if I knew there was a guy inside, why the I wouldn't do something stupid like this, like pulling this on the car like that. Because I drove by a lot. There's a lady, I came, maybe they used her now watching. There's nobody inside the car. I'm like, oh man, if I ran out of gas, walked the corner gas station or something like that. So let me just pull it in front of it. I'll pull my flashes off and everything. Hey, call out the tag, call out the, you know, like the broke down vehicle and everything. See if it needs to be towed or what. So and the only reason you got out there was because you didn't have a seat jump in. Yeah. Okay. She caught me off guard. And it's, again, like, I, I preached that stuff and I went at it. Officer Ron, yeah. at one point you said that when he got out, you said, hey man, please, yeah. can I help you? But at what point did he say, what, or what, he said something? He right? said right on the second he got out the car, I jumped out immediately and he said, I'm good, man, I'm good. Even before or after? Even, even before. before. That was the first word. He said, hey man, I'm good, I'm good. And I responded, hey man, please, can I help you? Did he say anything after that? No, that was that that that, that was like the quicker. It was like wait a minute. A normal person would be like, you know, if a normal human being was broken out and I identified myself as a police officer, and like wanted to help them, they're like, no, no, I'm good. I'm waiting for someone to come bring the gas, or, or I called a tow truck already, or whatever the case might be. And he immediately just jumped back and I saw that fucking gun come at me. At that point, it's like he knows I'm a cop. I identified myself. This guy's trying to kill me, you know? And I, I didn't want to die. Did you have anything else? that would identify yourself physically as a police officer. I didn't get a chance to even grab my wallet out because the funny thing is earlier in the night I was in, uh, in the aisles and I was doing my patrol in the aisles. As you enter the aisles, you make the first right and there's a gentleman walking his dog and he immediately saw me and, and because I was blacked out in the van driving around and I immediately grabbed my wallet and I'm like this, I was like, sorry I'm a police officer, it's okay, we're here doing surveillance and everything. So I knew identifying myself right off the bat. But this happened so quick, you do that gun so quick on me. You got the You have the holster for your gun yeah. with you? Yeah, no, they have it. What is the attachment you have on your belt? Oh, this is for my life holster. Okay. Did you have that tactical belt on at the time? Yes, this is the same exact belt I had on. Okay. This right here, I had it in the waistband holster, and the whole thing with the drop leg holster was, you know, if I do need to go out, something like that, put the vest on, put the holster on, and then go. Okay. Um, so let's talk about two other things. Yes. The, uh, 
when you said you, you swore your shot up there when you first put the gun at you, did you see if it had an impact on him? Did you notice? Were you watching him? I, I, my my aim was I was watching that gun. Did he phone in? No. Did he stumble? Did he say ouch or shot me or anything? Did he say anything at that point? Nothing. Nothing was said. Nothing was. And he was just pointing the gun, right? I no body reaction to indicate something there. No, sure. nothing was flight at that point. And uh, which hand was he holding the gun? Right. Okay. And again, do you remember where it came from? He was like again, like my view was blocked by that door a okay. lot, so I couldn't tell if he had it in his waist, if he had it in the door, if he had it on the seat. I don't know. Okay. I remember seeing that thing coming right at me. When he ran, when he ran, was he close friend back? I, I saw him running. Not fast. Not fast. Not fast. It wasn't fast. It was not, I'm, it was, I, I still had. Like he was a, I guess he was, you just said he was in the full sprint trying to run away, he would probably made it a lot further. Okay. And... Again, okay, I'm going to ask you to do one thing after yes, I ask you one more question. The blood, you said he got a little bit. Did yes. you do that? When we went, once we found his body and everything, and it was only me, Sergeant Sprague, and Sergeant Anderson, and when we saw his body, we flashed the light on him, we, and we were up here at this guardrail, right kind of like uh, with this emergency truck that's sitting at. And we looked down and we're like, oh, there he is. His hands were tucked underneath him. Right. We couldn't even see his hands. So a sergeant, one of the sergeants said, we need to go make sure that he does, he's, he's uh, you know, that he's not alive still. He's not holding on to the weapon and everything like that. And Sergeant Anderson had the shield out. I was behind him in shield cover like this. And Sergeant Spratt was a little further from me with the rifle out. And we slowly approached the body. Uh, I, think, I think we gave some world test. Show me your hands, show me your hands. And nothing happened. Didn't move, didn't even flinch. And uh, uh, Sergeant Frank said, Rod, we got covered, holster up. So we got to pull his hand up. And so I holstered, I pulled his hand up, pulled the other hand up. And then um, I'm not sure if it was Sergeant Frank or Sergeant Anderson that said, we're going to flip him just to make sure that, that he's not laying on top of the gun. So I grabbed his arm and I flipped him. There was no one not to say sorry, but I was like, okay, he's clear. Let's call a uh, fire rescue up. And I walked around like, I'm going to go wash myself. I'm covered in blood. And where did you do that at? Uh, I, there's a rescue, there's a fire truck and an ambulance spot right behind it with the rescue. And I walked back down, I was like, I need to wash this off. And uh, uh, the, the firefighter, she grabbed a bottle of hydrogen peroxide, popped it, and just started dumping it all over me, and I was just washing myself. I'm going to go back when, when the gentleman was rolled over. Did, yeah. you, did anybody check him? Did, no. any no. kind of, no. did you see anything on the ground around him? We, we just kind of like did this and this and this. We need to get out of this. We, need to, we can't we shouldn't contaminate this crime scene anymore. And didn't see anything I, out of the area? No. Okay. Was that truck here with this truck? No, this truck was like way towards the end. They just needed more lights, so they called it in. And, um, did you have anything to do with recovering anything that happens around? No. Whether it be shell casings or guns or anything like that? Second, that happened. Second, I washed my hands. Uh, Sergeant Anderson was like, Raj, you need to be with me. And he took me. Do you see where those officers, where those guys are standing right there by that car? Yeah. Right there. And I was there for the rest of the hell out of the No. no. Yeah. Did you get into a car or were you still outside? No, I was outside the car the whole time until the command bus, our command bus came and I got into our command bus. And then your command bus came and I switched over to yours. Okay. What's the first thing you did when you yelled police to him? Second, I said, uh, hey man, police, he immediately just stepped back and I saw, I remember clearly seeing that gun over that door pointing right at me. Tell me, tell me about, you, you mentioned your, uh, I want you to talk about your emotions at the time mm -hmm. of the entire incident, but take it from when you, when you first popped out of the car. Uh, you thought it was unoccupied, you said? Yeah, I... Tell me about your emotions and how they progressed. Okay, well, again, like I said, uh, I couldn't see any occupants inside the vehicle at all. I thought the vehicle was completely unoccupied. That's why I pulled up like I like my like retard in front of the vehicle. Because my whole plan was, I want to pull in front of the car, but I want to make sure we know that just back away, there's a car abandoned over here on the side of the road, or there's this, I'm going to go check the gas station and everything. Right. And mm -hmm. the second as I come, the guy pops out out of, out of nowhere, jumps out, and I go, oh, no. And I immediately, I'm just used to, you know, throwing that thing in the park and jumping out of the car. Just like, you know, training what we do almost every, on a daily basis. 
and it just immediately my hand just kicked, and I didn't have to think about it. And that's like, and it's a whole other thing. Like when I saw that gun, and I drew on it, and I was like, and I'm the question myself, how did I draw that face on this guy? And it went from like almost say it's nothing. It's just a car roll, but now I'm holy fucking about to die. And it was just a like you immediately like thank you. You know, all I could think was this, the night before I went home and my wife saw me playing, she was like, what are you doing? I was like, I'm just doing surveillance class. And the first one was I from up, going to bed, I was like, oh, he's still inside the van that's next to me. If I need it, I can throw it on and everything. And all I could say was, this is fucking kid, man. How did he get out of that car? Did it look like he had just opened up the door and stepped out? I saw him walk out fast. Like, like, I could, like, I could tell like, to do something left or right because I, you know, my back three had been a lot. I just saw him pop out and go straight down the hole. And it just caught me off guard. I was like, fuck. Red laser, he said that. Did it flash or was it? It was just like flickering. It was flickering? Yes. You, you said you know about guns. Yes, sir. Laser Max is the only company that makes a laser that goes in the dialogue of the gun. And they're not a steady laser. They're supposed to, they're designed to flicker like that to give you like, hey, this is where I'm at. And did you see, were you there when it, was there, if there was a gun recovered, were you there? Did you see it afterwards? I, I haven't seen it, but I haven't seen anything. Oh, oh, again, like, you know, after we got the body and everything, after I washed my hands, they immediately took me over there and I've been there, you know, the whole time. Now you said you saw the laser, did you see the end point of that laser at any point? There is the laser, oh, like where it was, yeah, okay. Okay, two more things. Yes, sir. Do you remember when you discharged your weapon? You said you believe those out there, um, did you discharge it anymore? Yes, I did charge it, and, and this, this is what I'm saying, it's like when, when he was running, and I was running, I was yelling, drop the gun, 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 and I'm yelling at this guy. He dropped the gun at the top of my lungs, and I see him do one of these numbers come back, and all I remember saying to myself in my head, I'm like, aim! And I didn't yell, 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 I'm like, aim! And I put that front sight right into the black silhouette, and I squeezed again. Do me a favor, as best you can, the same thing. Approximate where you were. Which one is this? Because you were in the test fire earlier, like you shot twice. Yeah. This is the second. This is the second of the first. The second series. Okay. First series, second series. Very good. I remember I didn't talk to the guard, I remember I was coming wide. I remember I was coming wide, and, and I remember yelling, aim. So is it this very general? Very general, yeah. Okay. And at which point was he pointing the gun at you? Running back with his firm. He was running, he was running from me, and he did one of these numbers. Where? Where? Where, I was, where was he at, at that point? Yeah, yeah absolutely, yeah. yeah. Somewhere, oh, well, I'm not there. And, and, and this general was 17. Not good. I don't want you to get wet. No, I'm already. I'm already. I'll I'll toss him. Okay, we'll toss him. Okay. All right. Okay. Just this is approximate. I would say probably from about here to about this area. Correct. Okay. So right in that area. Right where he was when he was that's where he was. He turned around and and just. Just went like this, and I was like, I remember yelling, "Hey!" And just 
when he spun, you saw the barrel again. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah, I saw. I saw. I saw. I saw, the, I saw the, no, but I, I, saw, I saw the biggest thing is the table thing. Again, from my training and experience and being around farms and teaching farms and everything like that, this is a table thing. If somebody's running and they're looking back versus when they see a whole body and you see that fist come up like this, they know what the fucking body's trying to kill me. Did you see one at that point? Yes. I, I saw something that is. I saw something and then he dropped and that's what I thought I saw something silver fall. Okay. So last time we did it, we stopped and we looked back at the car.
Is that your serial address? Yes, it is, sir. And that is a bad, uh, department issue definition, too. Okay, that's a department issue gun? No, that's my personal gun. I qualified with it. I don't walk to you in the department, and that department issue of definition inside the gun. And the gun in the bed? The gun in the bed, that's 100% department everything. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Sorry, I apologize. This is this personally owned? Yes, sir. This is personally owned, but authorized by the department, and the department is qualified with it, and department issue. Okay. Sorry. 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 There are three live 40 around the magazine that you can get from um, the uh, pistol, and then one live round from the chamber. How do you usually load your weapon? Do you max out the magazine and then one in the chamber? Do you add that one? How do you do The magazine is always topped off one in the chamber. Okay. Mm -hmm. And the firearm that's in the van, same way? Same exact. Okay, so, so there will be 20 in the magazine and one in the chamber. So that's a plus five extender on those magazines. Okay, how many magazines do you have in the gun? Yeah, I just put the okay, no, 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 I said on the handgun inside the, my duty gun, there'll be one in the chamber and 20 in the magazine. So a total of 21. And do you have extra magazines in the car? Yes, on my desk I have two. And there are 20 also? No, they're not 20. They're, I think, like 17s or 18s. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Just for information, for the extra magazines, uh, at 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 5, no, looks like Lake Center 40 SCW, right? And that was the extra magazine that was on top of the holster. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes. So the guy's running in a nutshell, and he turns around. Mm -hmm. I don't believe it. He turns around and he starts with his right arm. Yeah, I saw his right hand come like this. I saw something in his hand pointing in my direction. What do you think of that one? He's gone. He's shooting at me. He's trying to kill me. That's right. And, and exactly. And that's when it's like, I think like aim came to me. It's like aim. And I remember picking up that front fight, putting it right in the silhouette and squeezing. Have you ever seen this guy before? You know? Never. Have you ever seen that vehicle before? No, sir, never. When you said, when you said uh, police, you identified yourself as a police officer. Yes. Any other time during this whole incident, did you say uh, police? I, 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 I don't know what to tell you. Well, no, I, I, I don't know what to tell you. I remember screaming, drop the gun, drop the gun. I remember screaming that. I'm sure I probably said police, drop the gun. You don't remember? I don't remember, yeah. Okay. Okay. Good. Okay. Defense, call your next witness. Mr. Lubin, you may inquire. Good morning. Uh, could you please state your name? Mike Leff Lafort. Mr. Lafort, what uh, what is your occupation? I'm a forensic consultant. And briefly tell us what a forensic consultant, at least one in your line of work, does. Uh, the company I work for, we uh, reconstruct crime scenes, shootings, homicides those kinds of incidents. And the name of the company that you work for? Knox & Associates. And is that Michael Knox? Yes. Okay. For how long have you worked for Knox & Associates? Uh, this June will be six years. Tell us, please, about your professional law enforcement experience uh, prior to going to work for Knox & Associates. I started with the uh, Jacksonville Sheriff's Office in um, 1974 and um, went to the Academy Road Patrol for 15 years. Um, in, um, all, in July of uh, 1988, I transferred to the Crime Scene Unit. I stayed in the Crime Scene Unit uh, for the next 15 years until my retirement in uh, 2003. Uh, while I was with the Crime Scene Unit, I processed um, 
a little over 9,500 crime scenes. 800 of those were death investigations. 500 were homicides. Um, okay, I just want to make sure I got it. Um, you were with the crime scene unit for a little over 15 years? Yes. Tell us, please, what the crime scene unit does. We would respond to any crime uh, from, any, from a theft uh, to a homicide. Uh, we processed all scenes. But just give us a little more detail. Process meaning what? what it we would photograph. We would collect evidence. We would diagram. Um, basically, it was the documentation and reconstruction of the crime scene to determine the facts. And when you say reconstruction, what does that mean? It means finding the physical evidence, comparing it to the testimonial evidence, and then trying to find as many pieces of the puzzle as you can to assemble the, the best picture to, to determine what has taken place. Does that include such things as collecting shell casings? Yes. And uh, de measuring them to determine their relative distance to other objects? Yes. Does it include uh, recovering firearms? Yes. Uh, does it include um, searching a crime scene for such thing as for such things as bullet bullets fired fired bullets uh, damage to property or things that might have been caused by those? Oh uh, yes, sir. That and blood. Uh, does it does it include does it include finding and put submitting for analyzation blood? Yes. It's and, documenting and then collecting and then submitting for analysis. And ballistic-related uh, items such as shells or shell casings? Yes, sir. Um, does it include photography? Yes. Uh, and is crime scene photography different than regular photography? It is. In what regard? Well, there's a number of circumstances to overcome. Uh, one would be the, the environmental conditions. So you have to be able to produce, especially at nighttime, you have to produce enough light to be able to make the evidence uh, illuminated so you can see it, so the camera can pick it up. Uh, so there's a number of techniques. If you, it, it just depends on what you're dealing with. Um, Close-up photography versus long range. If you're photographing victims' injuries, that's a different type of photography. It's much different than uh, normal types of photography. Does it include this specialty comparing such things as witness or suspect statements to what the physical evidence bears out? Yes. Uh, does it include documenting the lighting conditions? Yes. Weather conditions? Yes. Other environmental factors? Yes. Uh, does it include either uh, attempting to corroborate or contradict statements, for example, that a a suspect or a defendant or a participant may have made? Yes. Okay. In this case, uh, did you do a, a, what you believe to be a thorough review of all of the evidence? Yes. Were you given, and when I say you, I mean Knox and Associates, were you given all of the discovery materials in this case? I believe so. And did you personally go through all of the discovery materials? Yes. Did that include many photographs? Yes. Did that include, uh, for example, the, uh, the what we call the walkthrough video that we just heard here in court? Yes. Did it include um, the actual f photographs of uh, and documentation of the physical evidence? Yes. Including uh, shell shell casings, yes, including uh, parts of uh, actual bullet bullet fragments, yes. Okay. Did you take it upon yourself to visit the evidence room, uh, meet with the evidence custodian in this case, and to look at all of the evidence that was actually being held by the sheriff's department? Yes. Did you do that with anyone else? Uh, myself and Mike Knox. Okay. Uh, and Knox, Mike Knox is Knox and Associates. Correct. Okay. Um, so did the two of you work this case together uh, from the very beginning of it? Yes. Now, in that firm, in that company that you work for, do you and he have defined roles as to to what you generally do on one of these investigations, what he generally does? 
Yes, sir. What are those roles, please? My role is to bring in, uh, to, to review all of the materials that are submitted, all the discovery materials, and to go through and pick out the relevant information. Uh, our case, it's just the two of us, and our case slow doesn't allow each of us to go through every case individually. So my main role is to evaluate, to take out that important information, and set aside what's not relevant to what we're doing, and then inform uh, Mike about that. And might he make further requests of you to go do something additional, for example? Yes. In your work with the police department, and did you say Jacksonville Sheriff's Department? Jacksonville Sheriff's Office. Um, did you do, on these hundreds and hundreds of cases or thousands, I think you said, did you do similar work there to what you're doing now? Yes. Uh, and as a police officer with the Jacksonville Police Department, uh, were you qualified in this area in court? Yes. Allowed to give your opinion on things relating to crime scene work? Yes. Any idea how many times that may have occurred? While I was with the sheriff's office, I can, dozens. I don't don't know an exact number, but many, many. Okay. Now, what was your assignment, so to speak? What did you undertake this review to determine? Well, it was to evaluate the physical evidence and, and compare it, again, with the testimonial evidence. What was uh, uh, Mr. Raja saying, and then what does the physical evidence uh, indicate? And those are the, what we looked at. So, for example, in this case, um, Officer Raja may have said, I was standing here when I fired shots. Do you then look at the physical evidence to determine whether the statement was accurate as to where he would have been standing when he filed shots, fired shots? Yes, sir. Um, and it, is there a, a, a way to do that by looking, or by looking at the casing e ejection pattern? The cartridge case ejection, yes, the locations of those. And is, is, is a review of the cartridge case ejection pattern a standard a standard way that uh, crime scene analysis can be done to determine at least a general location as to where someone was standing when the gun was fired. Yes, sir. In this case, did you, did you have available to you materials from uh, both the local police and also the FBI relating to crime scene? Yes. Um, did those include, for example, uh, a shell case uh, ejection test that the FBI conducted? Yes. Okay. Now, I'm going to talk about the shell casings, but I want to go back. In terms of an overview of what you, you took on to do here, um, you, you, had, you had watched uh, the, the video that we just saw that we're calling the walkthrough video. Yes, sir. Um, uh, and in the video, references made to seeing a, 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 dark, a car parked on the side of the off-ramp. Yes. And you were aware that that had been said in the, in the walkthrough video, and uh, you've since heard radio communications in that regard. Yes. Okay. Um, in looking at the crime scene materials, did they – did including the photographs, for example, of the car, the, the car that was parked on the side of the road. Did, were you able to either confirm or reject the statements that uh, Mr. Raja made to, to his sergeant that there's a, dark, a car, dark car on the side of the road? Were you able to confirm that? Yes. In what regard? Well, the vehicle was there. It was in the photographs. And, uh it was parked on the side of the road where he says it was. And do you have any information that there were flashers on? Uh, the crime scene photographs indicate the flashers weren't on, headlights weren't on, the hood wasn't raised. And did Officer Raj also say that in the walkthrough or, or words to that effect? I believe so. Okay. Um, were you able to uh, reach a preliminary opinion as to whether or not uh, you, you could see inside the car, inside that car that was parked on the side of the road from PGA Boulevard or even from the off-ramp next to it? Well, there's a factor of the lighting, and 
that would probably preclude you from seeing into the windshield or seeing through the windshield into the vehicle and ident identifying anybody in there. And that would be the street light that was basically right to the would have been on the west side or to the right side of, of the vehicle, maybe a little bit behind, but that light shining down would have reflected off the windshield. Uh, the other thing is that I noticed in the crime scene photographs, the driver's seat was laying, was positioned farther back than would be the normal seated position when driving. And when you say the seat was back, do you mean back this way or laying back? The backrest was laying farther back. So what you learned from the crime scene was that the, the, the driver's side had a seat that was tilted back? Correct. Okay. Uh, not a norm, not what you would call a driving position. In other it didn't words. appear to be. In other words, a position that somebody might put it in if they were resting or, or something like that? Yes, I've been there for a prolonged period. Okay. Now, you heard, uh, you heard that uh, walkthrough video. Uh, let me ask you a few questions about uh, the, the, the knowledge that you have as a crime scene person about the firearm. Were you able to see all of the photographs provided uh, of the inside of Mr. Jones's car? Yes. Was there any evidence that a firearm had been there? Yes. What evidence was that? There was a gun box in, in plain view in the open glove box of the vehicle on the right side. And was it a gun box uh, for the same type of gun that you've seen in evidence and you know from the reports was ultimately recovered in the grass? Right. Comparing the serial number on the firearm that was found with the serial number on the box, they matched. So not just the same type, but the exact gun they found matched up with that box? Yes. Okay. And that box was in plain view in the photographs that you saw of Mr. Jones's car? Yes. Okay. Now, um, you heard on uh, the, the walkthrough that um, Officer Raja said that his intent was to make a left turn and to pull in, in front of the, S, of the SUV uh, to check it out, correct? Correct. Now, was there, were there anything about, and you saw the photographs of the van at the scene itself, correct? Yes. Of the undercover van or the, the unmarked van, correct? Correct. And did you notice anything about the, the direction that the tires were pointed in the van uh, which would either confirm or contradict his statement that he was planning on turning and pulling in front of the SUV. It uh, supported his, uh, his statement that he was going to pull to the, turning to the left and pulling in front. The uh, photograph indicates the left front, the, uh, both front tires were turned to the left. Okay. Now, um, you heard testimony uh, uh, today or you heard the walkthrough video today that as that was going on, Mr. Jones opened his door and got out, correct? Yes. Okay. Um, just as a police officer with the experience you have, at that moment, do things change in terms of what you have to, how, do you, how you have to react as a police officer? Absolutely. In what regard? But now you thinking originally that the vehicle is unoccupied. Now it's occupied. Somebody's getting out. Now what are, what are the possibilities? Uh, it could just be a motorist, but it also could be. Objection, Your Honor. This is outside of his range of expertise. He's crime scene of reconstruction. It's not use of force or police practices. What do you say, Mr. Lubin? I can ask a few more questions to, to qualify. Please do. Um, do you have training in, in, as a police officer over all your years in terms of encounter of uh, people in roadside stops? Yes. Okay. Um, and is that something they teach you as far back as the academy? Yes. And have you also taught such to other people? Have you taught uh, about police encounters and crime scene investigation? I've taught crime scene investigation, yes. I've done teaching at the academy, not, n not necessarily in, in felony stops or anything like that, but uh, I have taught at the academy. Is it within your knowledge as to what the proper procedure for a police officer is when someone uh, it gets out of a car such as this. Yes. Uh, and what are, and and do you f have you testified to such before in the past? I have. Okay. And what 
is the proper procedure for a police officer at that point. Objection, Your Honor. Same objection. They laid no foundation to say that he has a special expertise in traffic stops. The witness has even testified that he's taught crime scene investigation, nothing about felony stops. His only training experience is that of every other normal officer that does not meet the definition of an expert to come and give that type of opinion and testimony to this court. Okay, approach for a moment, please, State and Defense. Go ahead. You can ask, Mr. Lubin. So back to the point, Mr. LaFort, where, as we know, the van is pointing towards the SUV and is about to pull in front and the door opens and someone gets out. Let's limit the answer to what would be the proper procedures for the officer at that point. The proper procedure is to confront now the possible threat. Okay. All right. So in this case, is there evidence to support that that's what happened, that in fact the van was stopped before pulling all the way in front and that Mr. Raja got out of it? Yes. Okay. Now, I'm going to refer to a certain photograph that you've worked with throughout your testimony, but I want to just get the background. Did you go to the scene yourself and do measurements? Yes. How many times did you actually go to the scene of this shooting? We've been to the scene twice. Okay. And did you take measurements from various points of various locations? Yes. And I'm not yet asking you about ballistics, but did you – was there an aerial or a Google space photograph of this area that you used to place using the police measurements and the police photographs, various items at the scene? Yes. And that photograph, in other words, the photograph of the area, is it generally consistent with the numerous photographs that we have in evidence in the case? I mean, it shows the same areas and so forth. Yes. But the benefit of this one is it shows everything from a higher-up point of view. Is that basically – It's an overview of the scene. Okay. And on to that, did you take materials provided in the discovery and place them in the proper location on that photograph so that we can see where the van was, where the shell casings were, and so forth and so on? Yes. Okay. Now, in what form do you have that photograph so that Her Honor is going to be able to see it in a large version? It's in a PDF photo copy. Okay. And that's been transmitted to us, correct? Yes. Okay. So, yes. Okay. So, let me show you now what has been marked as Defense Exhibit 6 for identification purposes only. Could you please look at Defense Exhibit 6 and tell us what this exhibit is a photograph of? Yes, sir. This is a copy of the photograph and the information that I placed on that photograph, a Google satellite photograph. So, is Defense Exhibit 6 an aerial view of the area where everything occurred? Yes, sir. On this night. And all of the boxes on that, do they identify various items, objects, locations on that photograph? Yes, sir. The items of evidence and their relationship to one another. 
And is everything placed to scale? In other words, based on the measurements provided in discovery, measurements by the crime scene uh, sheriff's office? Person. It's an approximation. It's a it's a close representation. It's not to scale, but they're placed in the locations re relevant to the photographs and the measurements that we had. And then, do you also have, in addition to this, a key? In other words, that tells you from any one location to any other location how what the distance is. Yes. Okay, Your Honor. I would offer Exhibit Six into evidence. Here's a copy. No objection, Your Honor. Okay. May I, please. Thank you so much. Now, with the court's permission, I would like to magnify this a little bit. So yeah. let's call this Exhibit 6 for the clerk's purposes, aerial view diagram. Aerial view of scene, maybe? Something like that. Okay. Sure. Okay. Can we just turn this a little bit so this way? Okay. I think that's probably good. Mr. LaForte, looking at the screen, is this a just a, a blow-up copy of what you're looking at? Same yes. exact, same yes. exact. And did you create this using available data from the discovery? Yes. And also data from, well, just a, a Google photo. Is that what you did? Yes. Okay. Now, I want to talk to you for a minute before we start identifying items that are on the, uh, on the photograph. When you talk about crime or scene reconstruction, um, what in more detail does that mean? In other words, how do you reconstruct it? I mean, is it, is it, is it just based on physical evidence or what is it? Well, it's, it's the location and it's how did it get there and uh, what are the possibilities you, uh, you start out with a number of possibilities. You eliminate those that the physical evidence doesn't support, and then you're left maybe with one, but maybe there might be one or two or two or three. Okay. But reconstruction means doing, doing the best that you can to, to what? Demonstrate what happened? Is that? To understand the evidence, how it got there, and yes, the, uh, the, uh, the chain of events that took place. So um, did you notice from the discovery uh, how many shell casings were ultimately found? Yes. How many? Six. Uh, did you notice from the discovery how many uh, bullets appeared to have been fired during the encounter? There have been six. So the correct number of shell casings were located to match up with the number of shots that were fired. Uh, please say again. The correct number of shell casings were located to match up to the number of shots which appear to have been fired. Right. Well, this, the six shots that were heard on the audio and then six cartridge cases, they confirmed. Now, at our request, did you and Mr. Knox do a ejection analysis of, uh, of a gun of the same type, model number, as Officer Raj's Glock 27? We did. Cartridge case ejection test. What did you say? Cartridge case ejection testing. And as to that cartridge case ejection testing, how many identical firearms did you use to, so that you could make sure you had a good enough sample? We used three. So you had three separate Glock 27s? Yes. And were they the same Glock 27 recovered by the police in this case and submitted into evidence, the same okay. type? Same type, yes. Okay. And so you did a casing ejection analysis, correct? Yes. Okay. What did you determine from the casing ejection analysis? Well, in, in the testing, it indicated the cartridge cases ejected to the right and then ended up slightly behind. And was there a general average number of feet that that, that occurred? Uh, Mike Knox is the one that put all the information together. He's more familiar with the exact statistical information than I am. I was I was the one that did the shooting and then he, he took the measurements and, and did okay. that analysis. So specifically he'd be able to tell you the, the distances. Okay, but as to that 
a fair statement to say that there's a variation between the, let's say, the shortest and the longest distance that a shell casing comes to rest at after a firing? Yes. And, of course, the type of surface that it's impacting upon would be would impact on how far the casing might roll, correct? That's correct. Uh, did you and Mr. Knox endeavor to to do the analysis on the same type of roadway surface that was present here? We did. Which was what? Asphalt. Okay. Did the um, shell casing pattern, the cartridge casing patterns in this case, uh, as determined by the police, as, as determined by the crime scene, uh, find their way onto Exhibit 6 that you put together? Yes. Okay. And is Exhibit 6 that you put together uh, have, a, have two spots where there are blue circles? Yes. And do the blue circles show the location of the cartridge cases in first three shots and the second three shots? Yes. And that's the total number of cartridge cases found at the scene? Yes. And based upon the uh, the location of the cartridge cases as depicted in a circle, and I assume it's a circle because they don't land on top of each other, they're within that area, is that That's correct. correct. Your circle would encompass the area within which the cartridge cases were found? That's correct. And identified? Yes. Um, were you able to place, generally, where the gun was fired from to lead to the cartridge cases being in, this, in the blue circle that corresponds to those three shots? Yes. Okay. And did you place that information on Exhibit 6? Yes. And is that the, uh, the yellow, I'll call it a circle, maybe you call it an oval a little bit, is that within the yellow oval? Uh, the red ones, red circles. Uh, that's within the red. So, is the um, the two the two red areas show where Raja would have been when his gun was fired? The approximate location, yes. Within that circle. Within that so circle. you can't pinpoint it exactly. Correct. And the way you're able to determine that is you are able to, uh, knowing what the ejection pattern is, know that the casings would have come to the to the right and back somewhat. That's correct. And the amount of rightness and backness is based on the the general average, but it's with there they would all be within the circle based on your testing. Yes. Okay. So um, if you looked at exhibit six, for example, you can generally tell where the, the first three shots were fired from and where the second three shots were fired from. Yes. And they're identified on exhibit six. Uh, by the red circle of the, where the fire shots were fired from and the blue oval from where the cartridge cases were. Yes. Okay. Now, so regarding the rear of Mr. Jones's vehicle, of the SUV, right? Yes. Um, regardless of what was said during the walkthrough about where the first three shots were fired from, from your analysis, were the first three shots fired from a certain point uh, beyond the rear of the vehicle? Beyond the rear of the vehicle, in other words, in a more northerly direction than the vehicle? The first three shots, yes, were fired from behind the vehicle. Yes. Okay. Um, had the first three shots been fired from, for example, a position to the south of the door of the open SUV, would the cartridge cases have ended up where they are? No. The shell, the shell cases. Okay. Um, and also, from your analysis of the door, uh, likely would have hit the car, too, at that point? At that point, the left front door was open, and there were no bullet strikes documented to the, to the door or to the left side of the vehicle. So the physical evidence at the scene supports that the first three shots were fired from a distance actually beyond the rear of Mr. Jones's SUV, beyond meaning north or up the ramp somewhere. Correct. Okay. And can you tell Her Honor 
approximately how far, I don't know if you want to take the middle of the oval or whichever, but just tell us which you're taking. How far past the rear of the SUV would the shots have been fired from? Uh, if I can refer to my notes, Please. my measurements. Now, I, I don't have a measurement. We, we can't determine a, an exact measurement of where uh, Mr. Roger would have been, but we know the distance of the cartridge cases from the rear, the left rear tire. So given that information, um, like um, cartridge cases one, two, and three in that first red circle, they were between six feet four inches and 17 feet five inches from the left rear tire. Uh, that would indicate uh, Mr. Roger would have been behind the vehicle, estimate maybe five, six feet, maybe seven, um, somewhere in that ballpark. So based on the cartridge ejection analysis, the location of them, you're able to place the shooter of that gun, uh, Officer Roger, five to seven feet approximately behind the rear of the SUV. Approximately, yes. And, and that is consistent with where the cartridge cases were found. That's how you're placing that, correct? Yes. Now, in addition to that, um, are you able to make a determination as to where Mr. Jones was when the first three shots were fired? We have an approximation of what his position would have been. And based upon what are you able to make that approximation? Well, from uh, Officer Roger's account, and they're, they're moving backwards, because it started at the left front door, they've now moved back behind the vehicle. Um, after the first three shots are fired, Officer Roger describes um, Mr. Jones running around the end of the guardrail and running on the west side. So he's somewhere between the rear of the SUV and the beginning of the guardrail. Uh, approximate maybe 20, 25 feet between the two. Again, there's no way to establish that specifically. Approximately 20 to 25 feet between Raja and Jones? So about that. Okay. Now, based upon that analysis, were you able to look at the physical evidence at the scene and make a determination as to whether there were any bullet strikes to any physical objects in line with Mr. Raja firing towards Mr. Jones in the first three shots? Yes, sir. Okay. And what did you notice from the crime scene photos and the evidence? Well, there was a bullet strike to the um, south side of the palm tree, which is north of the, um, of the scene, and then it's on the west side of the guardrail. So it's on exhibit, on exhibit six, but it's designated with an arrow that's entitled palm tree? Yes. And I'm pointing at it here? Yes. Now, were you able to tell whether the mark on that palm tree was a bullet strike. It most probably was. It, uh, all, it, the uh, characteristics were consistent with a bullet strike. It was round. It was at the base of the tree versus being up high in the tree. If it was up high, we would probably not consider that a bullet strike because it would not be in the line of fire. So it was on the side of the tree that the shot originated from. Um, it was consistent in size and shape of a bullet hole. It also had uh, there was photographs of the crime, the crime scene photographs indicated the sap was, was coming out. Uh, so it was tree. a fresh mark to it the was tree. fresh mark. When we blew up the photograph, you could also see the fibrous material inside the palm tree, and you can see the glistening of the water, the sap that's coming out. So based upon your analysis, it was apparent that the strike to the tree was a fresh strike, and of course the crime scene photos were taken. All indications that it was, uh, was a bullet strike. Now, we're going to talk more about this also with Mr. Knox, but based upon a, a, an analysis of the trajectory of the one bullet that hit that tree, uh, would, the, would that trajectory been, have been consistent with being fired from the, an average height that a man of Mr. Uh, Raj's height holding a gun in front of him would have fired? Objection, Your Honor. This is outside of his area of expertise. Even in deposition, he said all trajectory analysis was performed by Mr. Knox, and that his basis was on crime scene procedures. Are you able to testify to that? Are you able to answer that question? I believe so. Yes, ma'am. Okay. I'll allow it. Go ahead. You can ask. Go ahead. Please rephrase it. 
Yeah, I'm interested in knowing whether the bullet strike to the palm tree would have been consistent, consistent with a man of, uh, of Mr. Raj's size in a general, in a general area that the, the pistol would have been held. Is it consistent with having been fired by, by a person such as him? Yes, it is. And that's why I say, again, it was at the base, near the base of the tree versus being up high. And it was, would have been in that line of fire. Okay. In your review of all of the evidence in this case, was there anything that you found that would be inconsistent in any way with the locations of the Raja during the first three shots, the cartridge cases, the strike to the tree? Is there anything inconsistent with the evidence in this case that would contradict that that was the location? No. Okay. So I got a while to go. I don't just tell me at what time you're going to stop. And Keep going. Okay. Now, did you also then do an analysis of the of the second three shots? Yes. Same type of analysis. Yes. And on your exhibit six, you have an arrow pointing to a red oval that says Raja during the second volley, and you also show the three the blue oval with cartridge cases four, five, and six. Yes. Okay. Um, again, how did you had you place the red circle? Had you placed the blue circle? Again, based on the location of the cartridge case testing that we did, understanding the ejection pattern, uh, Raja would have been to the left side of those cartridge cases. Uh, Raja also described uh, in his walkthrough video where he believed he was in the roadway. Uh, so, using all that information, that we were able to indicate the approximate location where he was during that second volley. Now, um, was there a bullet strike associated with the second volley of three? Yes. And where was that? Uh, that was to a pine tree, which was on the west side of the ditch uh, and north of um, the second volley. So the pine tree... I um, object to that also, Your Honor. Once again, he's talking about trajectory, which is not something that he performed that's performed by Mr. Knox. Approach for a moment, please, State and Defense. Regarding the uh, pine tree, did you, were you supplied in evidence photographs and information about a, a bullet having struck the pine tree? Yes. And was that work done by the FBI? It was. Okay. And did the FBI do that work while the pine tree was intact, or did somebody saw it, saw it apart? Well, they found the bullet strike while the tree was still whole. They documented the hole. Uh, they didn't do a trajectory analysis at that time. They then cut the tree apart and took out the section with the bullet. Okay. So a the bullet strike was located by the FBI while the thing, while it was still growing, right? The tree was still there. Yes. And then it got sawed off and sent up to Washington or whatever? Yes. Okay. Um, and... Mr. Knox then 
did a trajectory analysis, which I won't ask you about. He, he'll talk about that. But he did a trajectory analysis to, to determine, I'm not saying which way he determined, whether or not the pine tree strike was consistent with shots being fired from, by the Raja gun during the second volley of three. No, sir. I did that. You did the measurements? I did that. Okay. So let's follow up. I know you did the measurements. What measurements did you do? What did well, you do? Well, I visited the scene a second time. I was by myself. I had to come to South Florida, so I went back to the scene. And what I did is I located the pine tree. And prior to doing that, I examined the photographs that were taken by the FBI. Uh, they didn't measure the distance of the bullet hole above the ground prior to cutting it. They just cut it out. The uh, FBI did? Yes. Uh, so to be able to do any kind of analysis, I would have to know the height of that bullet hole above the ground to be, to be able to get some kind of an angle. I was able to look at the photographs, and uh, one of the FBI uh, crime scene people were, was holding an um, evidence placard, a yellow evidence marker. Uh, they come in a couple of different sizes, but this one was the smaller version and it measured three inches. So I was able to determine the approximation of that three inch on that photograph and determine the height of the bullet hole because that, the, the photograph was taken prior to cutting the, the tree apart. So the hole was still there and I was able to estimate the height of the hole at 39 inches above the ground. 39 inches? Yes. What did you do with that knowledge? When I went back to the scene, then I ran a, a string. Uh, I anchored it past the, um, the tree on a fence. I had to come in across at the top of the tree at 39 inches, and then I ran it back to the signpost, uh, which would have been in line with where uh, Mr. Roger would have fired the second volley, uh, also where the pistol was found. And I estimated that. Let me make sure we got it. You ran a string which crossed the tree. It was tied to a fence behind the tree. Yes. In other words, just to the, to the west, maybe a little northwest of the tree, there's a fence. Correct. That's the fence, what, that separates the hotel parking lot from this area? Yes. Okay. And you ran that to where? Ran it back to the signpost. And the signpost is uh, where these two, lot, these two arrows are pointing more or less the Jones, where the Jones pistol was found? Yes. Okay. And by the way, from your review of all of the evidence and the crime scene evidence, Mr. Jones is Jimenez gun was found right at the base of that sign, correct? That's correct. By the way, while I'm talking about the base of that sign, uh, was there um, asphalt or concrete in that, in the area of the base of the sign? Yes. Between there and the guardrail, yes. And did you notice from all of the evidence, the crime scene evidence supplied by the state, uh, and, and including the medical examiner information, that there were some abrasions to Mr. Jones's arm. He had an abrasion to the middle of the right elbow, yes. And was that abrasion consistent with the material that, that covers the ground between the signpost and the... Objection, Your Honor, that's outside of his area of expertise. That's in a medical examiner's question. Sustained. Did you say sustained? Yes. Um, there was an abrasion to his elbow. Yes. And the area on the ground was made up of what? Uh, asphalt and concrete. In other words, so that there was no grass in between the pole and the guardrail? Very little. Okay. Uh, so you attach the, uh, the string from the pine that ran by the pine tree at 39 inches to the signpost? Or where did you attach well, it? Well, at the signpost, I estimated uh, Mr. Rogers, the information I had was he was six feet two. Uh, estimated at holding the, the pistol straight out approximately five feet five inches above the ground so I anchored the this end of the, of the string at five feet five to estimate muzzle height so based on the measurement of the muzzle height of mr. Raj's Glock 27 and based upon the string that you tied to the spot on the tree where you identified or the spot where the tree used to be identified at 39 inches um, what did that line up with in terms of where, in terms of your uh, red circle of Raja during the second volley of three? Well, it indicated that the second volley of shots were, were likely, most probably, associated with the strike to the pine tree. 
Well, but said another way, did, did the string... Yeah, I, once again, I'm objecting, talking about trajectory analysis. Let's talk about height. Let's talk about a string. That's fine. But he's just saying the same thing as Mr. Knox. If he continues to do it, then I'll object that Mr. Knox testifying as being cumulative. I disagree with that objection. Okay. He's not being given, given an opinion. He's, being, he's talking about his measurements. Okay. Let's stick to the measurements. Overruled for now. Go ahead. He can Based answer. Based upon the measurements, did the string, where did the string line up compared to where you placed Raja during the second volley? It lined up with that location. So in other words, based upon the actual string to the tree, there's a straight line that goes through that red circle. Yes. In terms of your crime scene analysis of the statement that Raja gave, uh, did Raja, during the walkthrough, place himself accurately during his video walkthrough compared to what the ballistic, uh, the ballistics of the cartridge case ejection demonstrates? He was closer on the second volley than he was on the first. But, but again, not within where the science has shown him. Correct. To be. Okay. And I assume that there is nothing, let me, let me ask it a different way. Is there anything from the evidence, the physical evidence, that would indicate which injuries may or may not have occurred during which of the three volleys? No. Was there any blood documentation connected to that you were able to see blood connected to the, the first three shots? No. Um, and from your experience as a crime scene, is that usual or unusual? It's with the first three shots, it's possible that you wouldn't find any because you got shots through clothing if it happened during the first volley. Uh, blood doesn't start flowing ex instantaneously. There's going to be a delay. So then if there's movement, it may be not, you won't find it till farther down the road. Um, And, of course, you don't even know whether he was shot during the first three, or if so, how many times. Correct. From the physical evidence and from your crime scene analysis, is there anything to indicate that either he was or wasn't hit with any of the three wounds that he received during either of these three volleys? Well, the only information that's cons well, consistent and possibly is with, um, with the second volley when he describes turning, uh, firing, and Jones falling. That would be consistent. I mean, it could be associated with a with gunshot wound. But no, no blood evidence. Uh, also described seeing in the walkthrough, seeing a silver object fall after the second three shots, correct? Correct. And the silver object being the gun was in fact found at the base of the sign? That's correct. Now, in yellow or gold, on your map, you show uh, a copper jacket with an arrow uh, just to the left of Mr. Jones's, where Mr. Jones is found? Yes. Okay. What is a copper jacket? A uh, copper jacket that's um, the, the bu a bullet. It's a copper jacket that goes around the lead core, and uh, that was found by the FBI when they came out and searched the scene. So not by the sheriff that first night or whatever, that first morning? Correct. And what is, how does a copper jacket get separated from the lead bullet? Well, by striking something. And uh, most likely, in this, in, in this case, it was associated with the bullet strike to the left forearm. And why do you say that? Well, the bullet entered uh, the, the upper forearm here and exited the back of the, back of the arm. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. 
examiner expert testimony? Sustained. Uh, let's not talk about what caused the uh, injury to Mr. Jones. Let's talk about what can cause a jacket to separate from the lead bullet without being specific? Okay. Uh, bullet passing through a body, striking bone, uh, it can deform the, bone, deform the bullet, causing the bullet and the lead core to separate. Can it also happen from hitting a more solid object, a tree uh, or something? It could. Okay. Um, would there be, uh, uh, could it, is it close enough to the palm tree that it, could have separated from hitting that tree and ended up over there? Unlikely. Because of the distance? Uh, the distance and the direction. Okay. Can you tell Her Honor from the, and I'm going to need you to give me some feet on these things, from the uh, rear of Mr. Jones's vehicle to where he, he was found at the end, how far is that? Uh, the measurement would be from the left rear tire of the SUV. Uh, it was 196 feet 10 inches. And were those measurements taken by the Sheriff's Department? Yes, they were. Uh, do you have uh, a measurement from the left rear tire to the signpost? where the uh, pistol was found? Uh, the measurement from the left rear tire of the SUV to the pistol is 72 feet, 6 inches. 72, 6? Yes. Okay. Um, and I think we've talked about the distance on the cartridge cases. Do you have a, do you happen to have a measurement from the rear left tire to the pine tree? I do not. Do you have a measurement from the rear left tile to the palm tree. Yes, sir. The, um... We lost the video for a second. Okay. There we go. Uh, the distance from the left rear tire of the SUV to the palm tree is 198 feet. Do you know from the crime scene review how many um, bullets, how many actual bullets have been, or parts thereof have been recovered of the six shots that were fired? Uh, would be one from the pine tree, one from Jones, and then the copper jacket. So it would be two and a half, basically, or three. Or at least three bullets or parts of bullets were recovered, and three went somewhere. Right. And I asked you how far, did I ask you how far the pistol was recovered from the rear of the SUV, the rear tire? Yes, sir, that's 72.6. Yep. Regarding the um, the crime scene review that you did, was it determined whether or not there was a laser attached to, at least when the police recovered it, to the fire to the Jimenez firearm you, that belonged to Mr. Jones? There was no laser attached. Um, have are uh, are you, you're familiar with lasers? I assume. Yes. Okay. Um, have you had the opportunity to see the the reenactment pictures showing the 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 light reflecting off the barrel of the uh, Jimenez firearm when the police went out? Yes. Okay.
Did you do a search to determine whether anything connects the Jimenez firearm uh, belonging to Mr. Jones to Officer Raja? In other words, was there DNA? Uh, Officer Raja's DNA was not found on the pistol. Fingerprints? No. And based upon your review of the evidence and the timing of things, did you determine that at the time Officer Raja gave his walkthrough statement, his under oath walk walkthrough statement, whether he had seen the gun or whether it had been found yet? He was unaware of, uh, of the pistol being found or where it was found, is my understanding. So in other words, said another way, he wouldn't, he, he wouldn't have known whether it had a laser or didn't only what he thought. Correct. Your indulgence. Sure. Cross-examination. Thank you, Your Honor. Afternoon, sir. Afternoon. You are an employee of Mr. Knox, is that correct? That's correct. And you share the same opinions in this case as Mr. Knox, is that correct? I do. You actually, in fact, trained Mr. Knox, did you not? I did with the Sheriff's Office. And you're an expert when it comes to crime scene procedures, is that correct? Yes. And the shooting reconstruction and those conclusions you leave to Mr. Knox, is that correct? The scientific basis side of it, yes, but I gather information. But you leave those conclusions to him, is that correct? Correct. And this is the first criminal officer involved shooting case that you have worked and plan and testify as an independent expert, is that right? No, it's the first one I've testified in. It's not the first one I've reviewed. I understand, but this is the first one you're testifying at, correct? Correct. And the work that you have done as an independent expert, that's as um, for the defense, correct? Correct. Now, your opinions regarding um, the crime scene analysis that was done by the FBI in regards to the pine tree and the trajectory analysis, um, did you believe that there were some deficiencies in that? Well, there was measurements that weren't recorded, and a trajectory analysis wasn't done at the scene until later, so um, it wasn't documented. So they cut down the tree before they measured it? Correct. And does that affect the ability to determine trajectory? I don't think it, in, in this case, it didn't deter, uh, keep us from determining trajectory. It would change the spe specificity, being able to get is there's always going to be an error rate, but cutting down the tree before you've determined all those measurements increases that error rate. So it would affect the ability to determine trajectory um, as specific as you could? Correct. And your partner, Mr. Knox, still per um, concluded a trajectory analysis and got a what you referred to as a ballpark figure? Uh, you're referring to what? I'm asking you. Your partner, Mr. Knox, performed a trajectory analysis and got a ballpark figure. Isn't that right? I, I don't understand. Tra trajectory analysis on what? On the pine tree, sir. Well, I did. Uh... I did the analysis myself. I was the one that ran the string. I'm the one that determined where it came back to. Uh, Mr. Knox was given that information. Basically, what we were able to determine is we were able to rule out where the shot could not have originated from, and you're left with this small area. And so the trajectory analysis that was completed after the tree was cut down, would you agree that it would give you a ballpark figure, not something that's as specific as it could be? It would give a ballpark, yes. 
and you have listened to the defendant's walkthrough statement, correct? Yes. Would you say that it is accurate or inaccurate as it pertains to the physical evidence in this case? Well, I think the physical evidence, uh, well, there's inconsistencies in what he explains on the walkthrough video versus where the physical evidence is. There's many inconsistencies, isn't there? Correct. There's an inconsistency between where he, the defendant places himself during the first volley of shots, correct? Correct. There's an inconsistency where the defendant places himself during the second volley of shots, correct? Well, he's, he's closer than the first. But he's still inconsistent with the physical evidence. That's what he perceived. That's what he remembered. I'm sorry? So that's what his perception was at the time. That's what he remembered. Is that a yes? Yes. So there's an inconsistency between where the defendant placed himself during the second volley of shots and the physical evidence, correct? Correct. There's an inconsistency in the fact that the defendant places the victim past the sign in the second volley of shots. Yeah, there is an inconsistency, but to what end? Inconsistency in your opinion. Well, it's inconsistent with the physical evidence, yes. You think that the defendant was not past that sign where the gun was found during the second volley of shots? No, I don't believe he was. Overruled for now. Are you able to answer that question? Uh, I can answer but the, the term aggressive. I don't know where aggressive comes from. Um, I mean, there was no skid marks. There was no indication that there was high speed, which would indicate an aggressive move. I mean, he was just approaching uh, somebody comes out of the vehicle. As a police officer versus a citizen, the police officer has to recognize danger. Now he has to confront that. That's his job. So you're saying that that's threatening that Corey Jones exit his stranded vehicle when a van pulls up suddenly less than two feet away from the front of his car? I don't know what Corey Jones was thinking. I have no idea what I'm... I'm asking you if it's threatening because you testified before that you can tell that this is a threat. So you it, classify it, that as a threat. I classify that as a threat, police officer, to some unknown person. And you classify the defendants driving his vehicle the wrong way up a ramp and stopping within several feet of the front of Corey Jones' vehicle, you don't believe that's aggressive? No. Do you believe that actually falls within the generally accepted practices of how to conduct any type of traffic stop or interaction between a law enforcement officer's vehicle and another vehicle? It wasn't a traffic stop, and I'd, I've done it a number of times, numerous times, multiple times. On the midnight shift, you're able to do those kinds of things. So just because you did it, do you think that's right? Yes. That's your expert opinion? As a police officer, yes. You, did you use the Leica scan that was conducted by PBSO in your reconstruction, sir? I used their measurements, yes. And you found no real issues with that, is that correct? I believe there was one measurement that was mislabeled, but it was, that was understandable. But that was it. The measurements were, were um, believable. And there in the first three shots that were fired, Corey Jones, you're saying, was actually behind his vehicle, correct? Yes. Approximately 30 feet? Possibly, yes. Out in the open with no cover or concealment? Yes. And at that time, the defendant was five to seven feet behind the vehicle. I uh, think you've got it wrong. Did you just say that? Okay, uh, yes. Yes. About that, yes. I was correct in what I stated, correct? Yes, first. So at the time the defendant fires his gun, he's chasing the victim. Well, he's pursuing. There's movement. That's obvious from the positioning of the shooting. It moved now from the left side of the vehicle to the back. So the defendant is moving towards the victim, and the victim is moving away from the defendant. Right. He's chasing him. What? Pursuing or following? Chasing indicates running, so. You don't think he was running? I don't believe so, not at that point, no. What in the physical evidence gives you the ability as an expert to testify that that victim was not running? A distance. The distance? Mm -hmm. You're actually sitting here as an expert in crime scene reconstruction and testifying to this court that you can tell that Corey Jones was not running during this period of time? I believe so, yes. Did you hear on the walkthrough that the defendant provided that he actually says that Corey Jones was running away from him? After the first three shots, yes. 
he actually said that the victim was running around the guardrail. Do you remember hearing that? Yeah, he said after he fired the first three shots, the Jones ran around the end of the guardrail and ran to the north. He was on the west side of the guardrail running north. And how far from the point that the victim was behind his own stranded vehicle to the gun that was found at that pole? Well, between the tire, the left rear tire and the gun, there's 72 feet six. If you're putting, estimating uh, Jones at 30 feet behind, then there's a 40 foot difference, 46 feet difference. If he's at 40 feet, then there's a 36 foot difference. So that would be the measurements. And so you're saying that Corey Jones covered the distance of 40 to 46 feet from the time of the third shot to the time of the fourth shot? Yes. And you're saying that's all the distance that he covered between the third shot and the fourth shot? That's indicated by the location of the pistol, yes. Well, just because the pistol's there doesn't mean that Corey Jones happened to stop there during the second volley of shots, does it? I think it does. The defendant gave a statement, and he said that Corey Jones was much further beyond that post, didn't he? That was his belief, yes. And he was there, you weren't, right? That's correct. And you're saying, what's the, what's the amount of time between the third shot and the fourth shot, shot? How much time? I believe it's 10 seconds. So in 10 seconds time, you're saying that Corey Jones ran the distance of 40 feet. Well, that's assuming, what, I, I have no way of knowing the direction he ran. I don't know if it's in a straight line or if he ran down the ditch and came back up. I don't know if he's backing up and not running at that point. You think he's really running circles away from the person who just shot at him? I have no idea. Anything's possible. Anything is possible. Right. That's what your testimony is. Yes. So it's possible that you're completely wrong. No, I don't believe so. If you said anything's possible. As far as the direction of his movement and his speed, they're, they're all variable. Isn't it true that where that defendant in his own sworn statement threw the cones and placed Corey Jones during the second volley of shots, that is actually in the trajectory line between where the defendant fired that second volley and the defect in that pine tree? It's possible, yes. It, but you omitted to put where he threw those cones, the defendant threw those cones indicating Corey Jones' location during the second volley on your map. You, you failed to place that there, correct? We didn't locate those, no. One second. I have nothing further, Your Honor. Okay, redirect, Mr. Lubin, sir. Um, I want to ask you about a question that was asked on cross-examination about whether or not stopping his van in other words, Mr. Raja stopping his van where he did a couple of feet from the car was aggressive. From the evidence that you've reviewed, isn't it, is it clear that the van wasn't stopped until Mr. Jones got out of his car? Yes. That is the action that triggered Officer Raja to stop his van there rather than to move it in front of and along the side of the off-ramp, in front of Mr. Jones's car and along the side of the off-ramp. That's correct. And as a officer, when, the, when a person gets out of a car like that, you're obligated to stop your car and, and, and take precautions, correct? That's correct. Uh, so I'm not going to ask you this question. I think I just want to make sure it's not your area, that it's Mr. Knox's area. The human factors area of perceptions and Objection, getting distances. Objection, Your Honor, to outside of his area of expertise. is also outside the area of my cross-examination. Yeah. Okay. Well, hold on one moment. Let me hear the question, please, Mr. Lubin. The, that area of human factors and perceptions during an event like this is not your area. That's Mr. Knox's okay, area. Okay. He can answer. Overruled. Go ahead. Correct? Yes. Okay. Um, are you aware of whether the Sheriff's Department, Florida Department of Law Enforcement, or the FBI ever did a, a string analysis trajectory measurement from the pine tree to, to any other locations to determine whether they lined up? Not string, no. Okay.
Now, to follow up on some of the questions about the second three shots that were just asked on cross-examination, um, looking back at exhibit, Defense Exhibit 6, since it's a two-dimensional picture, could you uh, explain to the judge this area, uh, let's, let's call it the area to the west of the yellow circle, the area that I'm pointing to down in, let's say, the middle of the swale, is that the same height as the street or is that lower? No, it's much lower. How much lower? I don't know the exact elevation, but the, the difference is probably um, close to four feet, I would think, three to four feet down, lower than the, the level of the road. And regarding the question that Mr. Fernandez asked you a few minutes ago regarding whether the location from the, quote, pla place where Mr. Uh, Raja placed the cones during the walkthrough as designating where he was during the second three shots. Um, in terms of from that point to the tree, if, if someone were down or down in the swale for the, and the, for the bullet to hit the tree at 39 inches above the ground, how far over the head of a person in the swale would that have been? It would have been a foot to a foot and a half. From that location, if someone was down in the swale? Yes. Thank you. I just want to ask you a final question about the shell casings. Um, were the two sets of shell casings generally a group of three and a group of three? Is that how they were? Yes. And do they indicate that those, each individual group was generally fired from the same location as the two, the other, the three in that group? Yes. Um, do they indicate whether the person who was firing was running as they were firing or standing still as they were firing? Well, indications are from their positioning. They, they, it would be more in line with somebody shooting from a fixed position versus uh, mo moving along and having a linear line of cartridge cases. Thank you. No further questions. Can I ask one on the recross on the, the swale that was brought up that I didn't actually bring up in the cross? Just one question, Your Honor. Mr. Lubin, do you object to that one question? The swale was not discussed. Uh, okay, you can you can have a, a brief redirect if you would like to. Go ahead, that one question, please. Sir, the swale that you talked about, that rises back up again as you approach that pine tree, correct? It does. Mr. Lubin, anything, sir? No, Your Honor. Okay. And this, did you already enter in, this is my copy, did you already enter in the copy with the clerk? Okay, so the clerk does. Uh, has been offered, I think, and admitted. But okay, well. I Here, I have a code. I'll just pass it. That's okay. Um, okay. So, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to take a break now um, for lunch. But before we do, let me talk to the parties up here just for a second to determine some scheduling issues. You can step down, sir. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you so much. Oh, thank you. Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, what we're going to do is we're going to take a break now. We're going to start back up right at 2 o'clock, okay? And uh, we'll see everybody then. Thank you so much. Orders and reception.